students, welcome back. It's been a long time since we did an online video. Okay, but for your end of your exams, we figured this would help you. So here we are. In today's lesson, we will be covering challenges and solutions in post-independent Singapore. Specifically, this video will cover the economic and social aspects. The pages that you see on the screen right now refer to the pages in your content package. So do take down notes as you go along the way. Okay? Okay, so challenges. Internal and external security challenges would have already been covered in the video that you've watched before this. So I'm going to start first by discussing economic survival as a challenge. So what does economic survival mean? Okay, think about it. Survival, right, means you need to survive. So economically survive, which means that chances are there are some problems related to the economy. And when we talk about the economy, we are always linking it back to money, trade and jobs. What are some problems that you think Singapore faces because of a size? Okay, you would have learned this in geography as well. Okay, you know for sure that we have very few natural resources. Secondly, because we are so small, we are very dependent on carrying out trade. Okay, and especially trade with our neighbouring countries. Okay, and we do not have a lot of resources in contrast to other countries that have a larger surface area. Knowing that these problems are there, okay, let's zoom into 1965 Singapore. Okay, what exactly was happening? What were the challenges they were facing? So we start off with challenge number one, which is poor relationship with neighbours. Okay, as you are aware, we just separated from Malaysia and Malaysia was one of the main markets for our manufactured goods. However, after separation, Malaysia imposed more taxes on manufactured goods because they wanted to protect their own industries. Okay, link it back to the idea of a common market. Remember, they were afraid of competition, right? So once separation occurred, okay, they made Singapore pay more taxes for their goods again and they can therefore product, protect their own industries. Okay, and this made it very difficult for Singapore's economy to develop because we are very, very dependent on trade. Secondly, okay, trade with Indonesia was also suspended because of konfrontasi. Okay, so link it back to events like the McDonald House bombing. Second challenge, over-dependence on anthropod trade. Okay, as you know, Singapore's best quality is the fact that it's very strategically located for trade. And because of that, okay, our um, port and our trading okay, is really top-notch. However, the problem at this time is that all around the world, Many countries were starting to restrict the import of foreign produced goods. Okay, in other words, they stopped buying exports from other countries. And remember, Singapore was engaged in trade. So it was very difficult for us to carry on just depending on anthropod trade. The third challenge then is high unemployment in Singapore. Okay, whenever there's an economic downturn or trade is slowing down, there will definitely be unemployment. So 14.3% of the entire Singapore population, okay, they were jobless. And the reason why this situation worsened is because every year, you have 20,000 school leavers joining the workforce, right? So for all these people who are leaving the schools, you need to find jobs for them. And to make things even, even worse, Okay, the British withdrew its military forces by the 1970s. And what that means is that when they go back home, okay, they bring back all their military forces, there's going to be a loss of jobs in Singapore. And as a result of that, that okay, 30,000 civilian workers lost their jobs. So how did Singapore respond to these economic problems? Smart. Okay, diversify her economy. You know that the problem is over-dependence on anthropod trade. So what Singapore chose to do is to diversify its economy okay, in four different ways. Develop manufacturing industries, the one you see on the left, okay, developing infrastructure, Singapore Tourism Board, and last but not least, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Okay, I will not be going through the fourth point because it's a little hard to explain to you online, so I will be focusing on the first three only. Okay, let's talk about developing manufacturing industries. So a manufacturing industry is basically a producing manufacturer, right? They're producing things. And they're producing things on a large scale using machinery. So we want to move away from over-dependence on anthropod trade. We want to develop more manufacturing industries. 
So in order to reduce Singapore's dependency on trade with other countries and increase employment, Singapore's leaders decided to focus on the development of manufacturing industries. Okay, how did they go about doing this? They decided to set up multinational corporations. Okay, short form, MNCs. So what exactly are MNCs? MNCs are foreign companies okay, that set up bases in Singapore to carry out the production of goods. So some of the MNCs that came to Singapore are 3M, Ford Motors, Shell, Mitsubishi and Texas Instruments. But why did they decide to set up their base or their company or their headquarters in Singapore? Okay, simple. The Singapore government gave tax incentives. In other words, compared to setting up their bases in other countries, they had to pay less taxes in Singapore. And this would eventually mean a profit in the long run because they are paying less taxes, therefore they are making more profits. Okay, so by 1966, there were altogether 26 MNCs. Okay, remember it's only been like one year since independence, right? There were altogether 26 MNCs and local enterprises that were set up in Singapore. So with these MNCs coming to Singapore and setting up bases in Singapore, they are going to hire local people. So this actually helps to solve the problem of unemployment as well. Okay, the Singapore government also reserved certain areas in Singapore for the building of factories. So these areas were known as industrial estates, okay, and one of them is called Jurong Industrial Estate. So if you go to Jurong today, you'll see a lot of manufacturing industries. Okay, this is how Singapore is trying to Singapore was okay, trying to move away from its over-dependence on anthropod trade and build itself up as an economic hub. The second thing Singapore did then is to develop Singapore's infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, we are talking about the basic physical and organisational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. So when you have very good infrastructure, okay, like good roads or buildings, or institutes. What happens is that in the case of roads, it actually makes it a lot easier for transportation of goods to take place and it helps businesses work efficiently. So what it does fundamentally is that good infrastructure attracts more businesses and more MNCs and foreign investors to set up base in Singapore. So for two examples of how Singapore developed her infra infrastructure, Okay, go and see page 178 and 179 of your textbook because there's a lot of examples. The third thing that Singapore did then, okay, pardon the typo at the top, okay, the third thing that Singapore did then is developing Singapore's tourism industry. Okay, it should not be developing Singapore's infrastructure, it should be developing Singapore's tourism industry. So what is the benefit of tourism? Okay, simple, you've learned this in Jog as well. Tourism attracts people, right? When people come here, they spend money. And when they spend money, part of the money goes back to the government in the form of your taxes. Okay, and therefore that helps to stimulate economic growth. And with tourism, the more tourism industries you build, the more you need manpower to work those areas. So there's an increase in employment opportunities. And it also attracts foreign banks to set up their offices in Singapore because you need to exchange your money, right? Okay. So some of the areas that were set up in the early 1960s okay, was Jurong Bird Park, Singapore Zoo, and Sentosa. And you think about it, okay, because of all these attraction sites that were set up between 1960s and 1970s, the number of tourists visiting Singapore doubled between 1970 and 1974. So these are the reasons why Singapore is still banking so much on tourism industry, right? Think about it, from 1960s when people don't really know what Singapore is to today when we have become quite an established tourist country, okay, tourism-based country. Okay, so as a result of diversification, Singapore's economy grew by 12.7% annually, okay, means yearly, from 1965 to 1973, okay, and that is no easy feat. By the late 1970s, our unemployment rate had fallen to as low as 3.5% compared to 10% in 1965. So that is how successful, I would say that that's how successful we have been okay, in terms of solving the economic challenges that we faced. Okay, so with that, we are done with economic challenges and solutions. Let's move on quickly to citizenship and sense of belonging. 
So in the 1960s at least, immediately after independence, there was no sense of being a Singaporean. Okay, we literally were part of Malaysia and then we were under the British and suddenly, okay, in 1965, when separation occurred, we are now Singaporean. But no one really had a clue as to what it meant to be Singaporean. So there was no national identity and people didn't feel like they belonged in this land. Okay, and this was a problem because it's a new country starting out, okay, and you need people to feel proud about their country. The other challenge that we face in terms of the social aspect really then is poor living conditions. Okay, the picture that you see on the left is actually a, like a kampung, okay, Bukit Tima. I'm not so sure about the one on the right, but it, both these pictures are from Singapore and they show you what the life was like back then. Okay, it's not that kampungs are bad. Okay, in fact, I think a lot of my family members who stayed in kampongs, they say they really enjoyed it because of the closeness and the tight knitness. Okay, but one problem here really was the hygiene and sanitation. Okay, there was no proper area of disposal of their rubbish. Okay, and there was a lot of diseases. Okay, because they were living near the rivers and the seasides. So this was a major concern for Singapore. And this was a problem that the Singapore government had to tackle. So how did Singapore respond to these social problems? They started with the creation of national symbols. Okay, this is a solution to the problem of a lack of national identity. And one of them is the Singapore Pledge. Okay, do take note that the Singapore flag and all that, they actually came before in 1959 when Singapore got self, uh, internal self-governance. Okay, so 1965 onwards, we had our Singapore Pledge. Okay, this is something that students recite every single morning, including you. Okay, and it's part of developing that identity as a Singaporean. Okay, but if I go above and beyond the textbook and not just think about national symbols, there's a lot of things Singapore does to embrace the identity of a Singaporean. Okay, for example, National Day. Things that are very unique to our country. And to solve the problem of poor living conditions, okay, there was the introduction of public housing, your HDBs. By 1965, 53,000 okay, new flats were established. A lot of the older estates are areas in, like, uh, in areas like Queenstown. Okay, so these are all policies that the government came up with to solve the challenges that Singapore faced in the past. Okay, with that, I've come to the end of this video. Please remember to watch the other video on security challenges and solutions if you have not. If there's anything that you're unclear about, okay, please do approach us and that's all for now.